The Buckeyes might be different. Penn State's the same, and so is USC. Almost a bevy of major upsets, but it turns out the college football playoff might look very similar to what we've seen. And do this, don't do that. Can't you read the signs? This is the College Game Day podcast for Monday, October 23rd. Reese Davis here. Pete Thamel is on assignment. And what a weekend it was in Columbus, Ohio, College Game Day, going back to the banks of the Olentangy for the showdown against Penn State. And things turned out pretty much the way they always do when those two teams get together. Ohio State won. Penn State threatened. Penn State couldn't get over the hump. Call goes against them. Subject of depending on whether you were wearing blue and white or scarlet and gray as to whether you thought that was was the appropriate call when Penn State got a defensive touchdown, but it was pretty apparent until the end of the game that they weren't going to get close to getting an offensive touchdown. The Ohio State defense was sensational. And this is the second time that Ohio State has been in a high leverage, big time stakes game and won the game with their defense instead of unleashing that vast array of offensive talent on you and outscoring you. Yet, I'm not sure that that leaves me more sold on the Buckeyes or less sold on them in terms of being able to win the national championship. Ohio State has the best football player in America who's not a quarterback, and he also might be the best football player, period, in Marvin Harrison Jr. Everybody in Ohio Stadium knew that Ohio State's only chance to move the ball was to get the ball to Marvin Harrison, and yet they did against a really elite Penn State defense. So that makes you feel good about their ability to get the ball to their best player, but you don't know if they're able. They weren't able to run the ball, but not many will on Penn State. And you also wonder about the overall explosiveness against better defenses. The flip side of it is that the Buckeyes prove once again that they can win a defensive struggle, just as they did against Notre Dame. And Jim Knowles' system Uh, seems to really have taken hold in Columbus and given them a tremendous chance. And now Ohio State is on a collision course with Michigan, which it always seems to be. And if they get over the hump in Ann Arbor, one will assume that they'll make their way to the playoff and see if they can win the national championship. Those are really big ifs because no one is handling their business in college football better than Michigan, whether they have the signs or not. And we'll we'll talk about that in just a moment. In fact, we'll, we'll touch on it uh, briefly momentarily. But just as a reminder, we start these Monday podcasts with a weekend review, which is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. It ain't college football season without the delicious taste of an ice-cold Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. So before we get to Michigan and sign stealing and all of that kind of thing, let's let's think about Penn State for just a minute. One of the things that when we were putting together graphics for College Game Day on Saturday morning was all of these uh, notes of futility against elite opponents, not just Ohio State, but on the road against top five teams. Penn State hadn't won a game like that since 1994. Uh, The difficulties they've had during the James Franklin era, particularly against Ohio State and Michigan, but more broadly against top 10 teams. And one of the things I asked our ace researcher, Marissa Dowling, was to look up exactly how many times they were favored. And I want to give credit where credit is due. I heard on a radio program this morning, I'm pretty sure it was Josh Pate. So I want to give uh, Josh the credit if he's the one who said this. But I was wondering, okay, what are we supposed to expect from Penn State? That's why I asked Marissa to find out how many times in these games had they been favored. But Josh took it a step further and said, you know, people get on James Franklin, say he's overrated, he's this or that, when in fact, perhaps you should look at it in the context of he is the most perfectly rated coach in college football because he beats everybody, virtually everybody he's supposed to beat, and yet they can't step up and beat the teams they're not supposed to. And I think the number is against top 10 opponents, he's something like three and 16. I think that's the right number. And they've been favored depending on where you look once or twice. So he pretty much does what he is expected to do. So that then leads you to the broader question about Penn State is, are they capable of more with this team this year or as a program and a program? And if so, what do they need to do to get there? The first And most obvious answer was that they have to have some better play from their quarterback. Drew Aller looked tight, 
going back to his home state. Certainly the first time he'd been in a situation like that where it was all on him. There's opportunity to improve there because I do think that he's got a a strong skill set that they can build around. They need more explosive guys on the outside, but I think more than that, they've got two studs at running back. They've got maybe the best left tackle in college football in Olu Fashanu. Run the ball. I mean, I know I sound like one of those fans that the answer is always run the ball, but every time they would start to get something going, even if it was just a little bit against the Penn State defense, or against the Ohio State defense, I should say, they change course. And I understand mixing it up, keeping them off balance. You can't do the same thing. Run the ball. I mean, you've got two elite running backs, particularly Singleton. Give me some screens. Give me some dumps. Show me some motion. Do anything to get the ball in their hands in a variety of ways. It's going to help your offensive line against the pass rush. It's going to help the quarterback. And ultimately, it might help you be a little less predictable and a little more productive on stages like this. The good news for Penn State is they still have the opportunity to create the three-way tie in the Big Ten East that we talked about when they get Michigan on the second Saturday in November, I believe. But there's nothing that you saw in that game and from what you've seen from Michigan up to this point that would make you think that absent the Wolverines playing their B-minus game, that Penn State would win that game. But, like I often like to say on this podcast, nobody instituted a NCAA rule that says you can't improve or that you can't play better from one week to the next. And like Lou Holtz always said to me on the college football Saturdays for that decade that I spent with him, you do not get the same team every week. Uh, and that was certainly borne out by a number of games this past weekend. Washington, Arizona State that we'll talk about. North Carolina, don't even get me started on North Carolina. That that was the most North Carolina football loss that ever North Carolina football uh, but maybe talk a little bit more about that with Ryan McGee when uh, when he joins us in just a few minutes. But I do want to go back to the setting in Columbus for college game day and the Michigan story that broke on Saturday. Anyone listening to this podcast is familiar with the details. Michigan is alleged to have commissioned representatives, basically spies, to buy tickets. And when I say commissioned, we don't know who, if it was the athletic department or if it was Connor Stallions, who was a low-level, uh, that's the phrase that's been used, a low-level analyst uh, who has a uh, Navy background, I believe, um, to go to games in person, shoot the opposing team signs, and decipher their signals. There's nothing wrong with stealing signs in the moment or by watching television copies of the tape or by watching all 22, if that will show you anything, which is highly unlikely. But if you could figure out something from that, that's part part and parcel of preparation, watching it in the moment uh, on TV. What is not allowed because it's against NCAA rules, it's right in the rule book. You cannot scout in person and you certainly aren't allowed to go and buy tickets and videotape. Uh, people in person, if they in fact did that. That's what has been alleged. I imagine there's going to be more that comes out on this story over the course of the week. As it pertains to college game day on Saturday morning, it created uh, quite a debate on Friday. The background on it is this. Uh, The great O Cementalist, who was with us on the show, tremendous entertainer. Uh, You've probably seen him on America's Got Talent or on Hard Knocks or, you know, any other of a variety of places where he has been mesmerizing to people around him with his uh, with his tricks of the trade, his skills, whatever his magic, whatever you want to call it. In the offseason in August, I believe we had shot a feature story in which O's the mentalist was ironically with Michigan or maybe not ironically, he's a Michigan grad, but he was with them and shot this piece where he, you know, uh, wowed them with his expertise of being able to figure out what they were thinking. And we had talked for quite some time about when the piece was going to run. And because the idea was then the O's would come and he would perform these tricks with us on the set. And, you know, stump us with how he was able to read our minds 
There was talk that perhaps you would do it Ohio State Michigan week, but it seemed like it was too long a segment and not enough hardcore football for too long a period of time for that particular week. One in which um, you know conference championships and, and places in conference championship games could be decided and so forth, and maybe that wasn't the right feel. So it was settled that it would be this week. Michigan, Michigan State playing, you know, at the time in the preseason, as we looked at it, you know, potentially a an impactful game. Um, as it turns out, it was a mismatch, but we would do it this week. O's was gracious enough to uh, accommodate us from a scheduling standpoint to to come to Columbus and be with us. Well, then this Michigan sign story break breaks and there was a, not a low level, a pretty high level of consternation among some in our group about the appearances of showing Michigan's players having fun, showing Michigan's players doing something lighthearted that perhaps it would be perceived that uh, we, College Game Day, uh, were going soft on Michigan by showing them in this light. And it, it got, you know, it got pretty intense, the discussions. And where, because we disclose things on this podcast, I felt this way. First of all, you have to prove that this was actually that this actually happened. You have to prove it first before you start down the road of not being uh, not being appropriate to show the Michigan players having fun ever. I mean, the example I used when I was making my point was: Are we not going to show them? Are they not allowed to celebrate a touchdown now? Are they you know say, well, maybe you stole the defensive signal and you scored the touchdown uh, by unscrupulous means? You can't have fun. And I was being facetious and obviously being a little over the top to try to make my point. But I believed that as long as we provided the context, this wasn't shot yesterday. We're not making light of the seriousness of these allegations if they are proven true. But this is a remarkable thing. And, you know, maybe there was the idea put forth that, well, we'll just have O's join us. And I was vehemently opposed to that. Not that I don't love the guy. He's sensational. Like watching him on television. But I was like, why are we dropping a magician out of the sky without context and just assuming that people have seen him uh, with teams in locker rooms and so forth uh, on this day? You know, we need some context around this. And ultimately, what was agreed upon after uh, uh, no small amount of time debating was that we would do what we did. In a more abbreviated fashion, I would tell America, be honest with America was how I phrased it, which is not, not something that I think always the American public feels like they're getting from television, but we strive to do that on game day. Tell them that there was a debate, that there is a disagreement about how we should proceed with this, that we are concerned that people will perceive us as going easy on Michigan if we show them having fun with O's the Mentalist, particularly if we show Jim Harbaugh being involved. Well, you know, I felt as if we needed to do this to provide context to O's being there or else maybe, you know, O's, you know, as unfortunate as that might be, maybe we would have to have him join us another time. So we we tried to be honest with the people and tell them how the sausage was made. We I think there's still a perception on the outside for anyone in television that there are puppet masters somewhere whispering in our ears the things that we should say. And that is just simply not true. Mm -hmm. On college game day, we don't have a teleprompter. We certainly have bosses. Everyone has, has a boss, but no one is telling us in our ear what we should or should not say simply because all of us on that set are too strong-willed to accept that. And for our bosses, they have enough trust and faith in us that we are going to be judicious and that we're going to be fair and appropriate when we opine on something serious. So we came we came to the conclusion that we show the piece. I explained it was shot, that we're not you know, making light of these allegations beyond what's appropriate. And we went on from there. So, you know, I think that Sometimes fans believe because, look, I don't I don't know the fans business, whatever they do for a living. I don't know the intricacies intricacies of that. I believe that they think sometimes that we are told exactly what to say, that corporate mandates things. And that just doesn't happen. We are not, you know, content is not dictated from on high, nor is it denied from on high. And in this case, it was not denied when uh, when. I was, you know, among those who really felt strongly about how this should be presented if we were going to present it. And, you know, the the funny thing was, you're not going to 
you're not going to please everyone. There, uh, I wanted to point out earlier in the discussion that we were taking the sign stealing seriously because of this, because it's against the rules, right? So if true, if true, Michigan cheated, and that's the end of it, because that's the way it's written in the rule book. Now, do I think that there is a comedic aspect to this? Absolutely. That was borne out because, you know, you set the over under on 32 and a half of the number of variations on the theme of a sign. Harbaugh stole my other sign or whatever. And we saw a number of them and they were funny. And this is the kind of thing that's part and parcel of college football forever. People attempting to steal signs. What's beyond the pale is if Michigan blatantly, if I said if, if they blatantly ignored the rules and sent people out to take their iPhones or whatever they did, and if they did it, and videotape and then decipher. Can't do that. If you are if you have bad signs and you can watch the TV copy of a game and you can watch in the first quarter from the press box and say, I've got this. You know, I know, I know when they're blitzing. I know when they're faking the blitz. You know, I, I know when... Uh, you know, when they're signaling in uh, the motion, when they're checking run to pass because they do this. If you get that from the TV copy or if you get that from the first quarter of your game watching them, well, then get better signs. But this is a little different. And it's also blatantly against the rules. And we wanted to to point that out. And yet we also didn't want to get into it or I didn't want and some others didn't want us to get into a space where. We couldn't show Michigan being normal until this whole case is adjudicated. And we know from the NCAA, NCAA's history, this is not going to be settled for quite some time. And it won't affect this season, in my judgment, tangibly in terms of them being eligible or uh, forfeits or, you know, vacated games or all anything that, you know, potentially possibly could happen that'll happen well after the fact and the only question will be is Michigan good enough and are they able to handle the potential distractions that are going to come along with this I would say they handled them uh quite swimmingly in East Lansing the other night and you know by the way I'm not even going to dignify the stupidity of Michigan State's trivia a thing on the Jumbotron, Google that and look it up. If you want to see a dumb loses more than smart wins, Michigan State, which is already in a cauldron of horrific public perception because of the way things uh, went down with the Mel Tucker thing, then just carelessly, uh, you know, allowed an egregious uh, image to be put on the Jumbotron as part of a trivia thing. And, you know, by the way, can't we do better in stadium timeouts than in trivia questions anyway? I mean, they apologize for it, but, you know, you want to talk about dumb loses more than smart wins? Dumb loses perception way more than, than smart wins there. Ryan McGee is going to join us in just a few minutes here. There were all a number of near major upsets this past weekend. You had UCF going for two to try to tie Oklahoma on the road late as a near three touchdown underdog, got a little cute on the two point conversion. That was pretty much on brand. I would say probably, uh, you know, in the uh, Gus Malzahn approach to offense and it didn't work this time. And Oklahoma was able to survive. Texas got a, how should I put this? A fortuitous spot on a third down play on a late drive from Houston that forced Houston to have a fourth down play, which they did not convert. Much to Dana Holgerson's chagrin, obviously they had to go for it. Didn't love the play because you you have to realize, even though Donovan Smith has a lot of experience and you know had put up big numbers against uh, Texas when he played for Texas Tech last year, in that moment, you know if you need a guy to get it out right on time, any you have to take into account the circumstances. Are you making the play as? Uh, I don't want to say easy because it might be easy to defend, but are you making it as uh, easy to execute as possible and as efficient as possible? Um, reasonable minds can differ. I would say that maybe not, but the bigger story to me is I still don't understand why they didn't give Houston the first down on the previous play. And secondly, we don't know if Houston would have gone on to score, but if they had, I would wager a large sum of money that Holgerson would have gone for two and gone for the win because you recall when he was the head coach 
at West Virginia. They had a similar circumstance against Texas, and they went for two and got it and won the game in Austin. This one was at home. They likely would have. Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina lost to Virginia in a game that had disappeared in the vast TV landscape somewhere along the way. But you can look up and find highlights, I think. They lost to a Virginia team, which certainly had shown some signs of improvement. You know, as it turns out, I do need to apologize for something erroneous that I said on College Game Day the previous week and might have even re- repeated it on this podcast. I said before the North Carolina game against Miami that this was precisely the game, type of game that North Carolina has lost forever. The kind of game that makes you say, well, that's why you're North Carolina football. What kind of team is Hubert Davis going to have this year? I was wrong about that because this is the game. This is the type of game, the Virginia game, not the Miami game that North Carolina has lost forever. The inexplicable loss. I want to give Virginia credit for improvement. I want to, I want to give them their due because they've been through a lot for winning this game. You can't lose this game. If you're North Carolina with a number one or number two overall pick in the draft at quarterback with a star receiver, with a running game, with an improved defense, with home field, with everything you have in front of you, a potential shot at Florida State, maybe maybe for a shot in the college football playoff, you cannot lose that game. And yet they did. And they fell right into the mantra, if you are not good enough, a loss will find you. And what I mean by that is sometimes we look at schedules and we say, well, they're they're better than them. They're better than them. They may not be the greatest team ever. They may not be elite. But look at the schedule. It can't just be about the schedule. Because if you're not good enough, you will step on a rake, hit yourself right in the nose, shatter shatter your nasal cavities into a million different pieces and blow it. And that's what North Carolina did. I know they can still get in the championship game potentially, but that was a devastating, devastating loss for them. Pleased to be joined as we are on Mondays by the great Ryan McGee. And Ryan, uh, being a native of the Tobacco Road era, do you take exception at all with what I just said about North Carolina? That was the most North Carolina football loss that ever North Carolina football lost. I mean, yeah. I yeah. want to give I give credit to Virginia. They deserved it and they are improving. You cannot lose that game with the stakes that North Carolina had and the personnel that they have. That is a that is a that's a punch in the solar plexus to the program to lose a game like that with the personnel they have. Fair? It's what they do. I mean, it's what they do. They, they they have not won a conference championship since Lawrence Taylor was co-captain. 1980. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, it's just, it is, I grew up on Tobacco Road. This is what, and I'll say this, this is what North Carolina does. This is what NC State does. This mm-hmm. is what, yeah, I remember, I, I wrote. It, it used probably, to be what Clemson did. It's why we called yeah. it Clemsoning. Yep. You it, know, it, it, and yeah. this is North Carolina-ing or Macking or something. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's not I, fair I, to just put it on Mac because it yeah. predates him and was oh, in yeah. the middle and is now too, so. No, Dick Crum did it. They all did it. So, so. I, I maybe gosh, I bet it was 15 years ago. I wrote a story for ESPN Insider. It was for the magazine and for Insider, and I and I listed the 10 programs that have never been as good at football as they should have been. And I had North Carolina number one, and you know I had Arizona and Arizona State in there. I had I had a, I had a lot of the the usual suspects in there, but but North Carolina to me has always been number one because of where it sits. Because of the fact that I mean, I grew up in the Carolinas. I know what the talent pool is as far as recruiting. You know the the facilities, the history. You're the the flagship school for the state, and this is just what they do. It's what they do, and I mean, it goes back to when Mac. The reason that Mac left to go to Texas, other than the fact that it was just the Texas job, was that there was a ceiling, and even he could not get North Carolina through that ceiling, and so it's just. It is. Uh, I, I knew they were going to lose the game because of what you always say a loss is going to find you. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it was going to be the Virginia game, but but there. But and of all the games to lose, right? But 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 also you mentioned the Virginia. 
congratulations to those guys. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's it, it's it's the story is it's been heartbreaking. You know, I write the bottom ten. I refuse to put Virginia in there all year because of what they've had to deal with, uh, even when they weren't winning games. And now, yeah, North Carolina, I, I sat right here on this show a week ago and said, why is no one talking about North Carolina? And now I think we know why no one was talking about North Carolina. Maybe everybody knew something we didn't. Uh, there, There's also, you know, how college football fans always find the little – uh, the little edge, and there's starting to be a growing thing. I think Sicko's committee jumped on this pretty quickly. That 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 was the CW game, wasn't it? The North yeah. Carolina Virginia game was that like somewhere on the CW thing? Yeah, or, think where, so. Okay, there there's starting to be a a whole culture of the theater of the absurd around those games, and it's sort of like the old Kirk and I love to joke about the JP Noon game, sleepy kick. Yep. You know, uh, uh, the legendary Mike Hogwood kicking around there for a while. You got Tommy Bowden on the halftime show. And before you know it, you look up and, you, and you're down, you know, you're down 16 to six. And, yep. you know, with six minutes left in the third quarter, it's starting. To, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on that because that's Clemson and North Carolina State this weekend, I'm told. So there's there's starting to be some uh, there's starting to be some old school vibes uh, kicking around kicking around with those CW games. So yeah, know, it's the, you know, the, the, yeah, it's the one you don't pay attention to. I remember when I was at Tennessee, it was like you, you had that 11 a.m. The kick Daves. At, at Mississippi State. Exactly. The Daves are going to, doing the game. And, and, yeah. and in the Carolinas, it was that noon game. And I, I can remember, and you, know, you know, my dad was an ACC official forever. And he had so many of those noon Jefferson Pilot games. And he would say, before, but he'd leave the house on Friday and go, y'all be ready because <laughs> – they won't be ready, you know, and it, yeah, it's just it's yeah. just how it is. And, it, and it's it, it, I, I'll go back to to my Virginia. Uh, my my famous story, infamous story, was here in Charlotte, where I live. Virginia had their one versus sixteen game in Charlotte that was airing on some far flung, you know, CBS family of networks. And I was like, you know what, I ain't covering this game. And I, my my wife Ubered uptown Charlotte, and we were in like a jazz club. And I check at halftime, and uh, and Uh-oh. number one Virginia's down twenty two to start of the second half. I'm like, you know what? I got to go back to work. <laughs> I ran three blocks and got back. So so yeah, don't don't you have to watch the games? You have the 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 darkest corners of the ESPN Plus app. You got to go look because you have no idea what's happening over there. I look at it all the time. Well, if you stayed up and watched Washington and Arizona State Saturday night which which I did that was that was the perfect setup to another study in human nature that exhilarating uh, near euphoric scene the previous Saturday for Washington after beating Oregon both of whom I believe are teams capable of winning the national championship and then human nature reared its ugly head again you have one win Arizona State coming in they have the lead and to Washington's credit they survived the scare and almost every team that ultimately becomes a champion has it has a moment now i don't know that it's always that extreme you know that was a pretty extreme moment against yeah. an overmatched team and and really uh poor performance by washington but they live to tell about it yeah. and i think there's a the real strength in that i it was really funny i went back and watched the play a few times because i try not to make you know, the dumb loses more than smart wins thing that we try to find every week just about a play that didn't work, right? So this doesn't fall in that category because I actually like Kenny Dillingham not taking the points there. You're up 7-6, you're late in the game, you've won one game, and you know what's going to happen in your soul of souls if you kick that field goal. You know what's going to happen. They're going to get pretty good field position. They're going to drive down. They're going to score a touchdown. They're going to take the lead. So you're fourth and three. You're going to try to get the first down. They they were playing man on the receiver they intended to. He followed he followed the receiver across the formation. Uh, the quarterback Trenton Borgay, who certainly made some plays for Arizona State, hit that last step of his drop and he turned the ball loose. And the DB who was in man who had been following it around knew knew the receiver was going to stop at that first down marker, and he just. He just ran to the ball. Uh, Mishael Powell, 89 yards. 
House, Washington survives. Championship teams, that was not a championship performance by any stretch of the no. imagination. In fact, no. it was a, it was a poor, it, it was a D minus performance from Washington all the way around. Even, even made Michael Penix no longer the favorite, according to Vegas, to win the Heisman Trophy. That's how bad it was. He had, he had turnovers and bloody nose and all kinds of things happened to poor Michael Penix um, on Saturday night. But you have, you have to win those like games. Professional, yeah. Like professional yep. wrestling, Ryan. Yep. Yep. Let me tell you something, Mr. Television announcer. They yep. don't ask me how I won. They ask me if I won. And the answer for Washington was yes, they won. To, to quote the great Danny Ford, you, you mentioned Clemson earlier. I remember Danny Ford when when he had Clemson rolling in the 80s. You know, they, they, they were top 10 every year, playing on New Year's Day every year. Of course, won a national championship. And I remember they had just squeaked by – I don't know the Citadel, Furman, some one of their one of their contractually obligated Palmetto State games they have to play, and they barely gotten through the game. And all the questions to Danny Four were, "Man, that was an ugly win." He said, "Yep, and I'll take eleven more of them right now." And he <laughs> said, "He he said this is not an essay contest." He said, <laughs> "All they want to know is how many games did you win?" But I talked to Josh Heupel about this after Tennessee won a gross game against Texas A and M, twenty thirteen. First win of Heupel's career where a team scored less than 30 points. And he said, you need to know that you can win a game like that. Now, unfortunately, they did not win a game like that the next week if you're a Tennessee fan. But his point is still valid, which is, you know, you know you can win the 45 to 38 game. You need to know that you can win the 15 to 7 game or the 20 to 13 game. And so, yeah, it's a character builder, I guess. But I, I – um. I, and I get why Michael Penix dropped, um, but I don't think he's I, – I, to me, he's still the favorite. Oh, he's not – He look, he's not out of it. That's just yeah. for the moment that that J.J. McCarthy, I think, technically is now the favorite. Uh, certainly, Caleb Williams dropped, and we can – we'll touch on, on that in just a minute. But since you brought up Heupel in Tennessee, I don't know that I've ever seen a game that turned the way that one did, and here's why. Because the first half, particularly the first quarter, looked pretty much like last year. Yep. And and the way that Tennessee was able to scheme Alabama, the first touchdown pass, which was a, a beautiful throw and catch from uh, Joe Milton to Squirrel White, Chris Braswell, who can run. I mean, look, he can run. He's a pass rusher. He, yeah. He's a linebacker technically who usually plays at the line. He was in coverage. Yeah. Last year – they they picked on uh, DeMarco Hellams, who is a tremendous safety and is playing well in the NFL, really good player. But he's not an open space cover guy who's going to be running with Jalen Hyatt, right? So they got the matchups they wanted again throughout a great portion of the first half. And you started to think, well, they have their number. They're a step ahead. What's going to change about this schematically? And everything changed in the second half. I mean, Braswell, Dallas Turner, the interior guys with a Boigby and Keegan and, and a few other ones in there, they they asserted themselves. And Jalen Milrow started running the football, which I think, you know, quarterbacks don't want to be labeled as runners. Jalen Milrow is so ridiculously fast. He's doing himself a disservice if he doesn't run the football. And he's not slippery like, uh, you know, uh, elusive guys in the pocket. He's not slippery like a, a Lamar Jackson side to side. He's more like a like a Josh Allen, you know, really fast, straight line, uh, powerful guy who can, you know, pick up big yards when he needs to. He's got to do that. And he missed a touchdown. On one drive, they had to kick a field goal because he left the ball with the running back. If he does that, if he starts running the ball judiciously on some of those reads and starts pulling it down the way Joe Milton did a few times for Tennessee, Alabama's going to be a handful, and at least in the second half, they were a handful. But the game changed remarkably after halftime. And then what we talked about the last couple of weeks – uh, you, me, and Pete talking about Alabama and the difference between Alabama now and Alabama three years ago was all the dumb penalties, you know, procedure stuff and you mm -hmm. know, substitution infractions. They had one penalty for five yards in that Tennessee game. A mm -hmm. year ago, they had 17. 
Mm-hmm. And th- that's why they lost the game. I mean, I, I, I was at both games. And, and 17 penalties for all, almost 150 yards, you know, that's how you lose a football game, a shootout mm-hmm. in, in Knoxville. One penalty for five yards. And so, yeah, it's – and you know, we've said this before. I feel like, – I go back to the Ole Miss game. I feel like the window was cracked open if they were finally going to pounce on Alabama and they let them get things rebuilt. And Jalen Milrow now versus the guy I saw a month ago, it's a completely different football player. Marty Smith sat down with Jalen, I think it was Wednesday last week, and Marty immediately called me when the interview was over with, and he goes, that's a different guy. Like, that's a completely different guy than the guy that we had chatted with, you know, in week two leading into the Texas game. And so, yeah, you know, he gets benched. He gets reminded, you know, you know, we don't need you. You know, we, we can figure something else out. And then he goes to work and fixes it, which is why they did what they did to him. And so now mm-hmm. you're exactly right. And then on the flip side of that is Joe Milton, who he is baffling to me because he had so many – there were drops in that game, but he had so many missed opportunities. I mean, just I mean, just little alley-oops that he missed in that game, and, and he is so in his own head right now. And the flip side of that is Jalen Milrow, who was in his head a month ago, and now, you know, he's right on schedule. He's right on the saving schedule. Here we are rolling into November, and the quarterback looks like he knows what he's doing. You you would know better than I, but, um, you know, I, I always, I'm all for – players having fun if they want to you know mess around with the crowd and talk a little junk that's fine that's part and part so if guys do it they have fun and it's all over it's not a big deal i i wondered with joe because you know joe did the the crimson crane after one of them and you know there was video beforehand of him really getting involved you know when the when the two teams came onto the field um and i've been around him some and i really really like him i just wonder if that's i wonder if that's him if that if he really feels that confidence, because I think that your point is a great one. Some of those stops, Alabama's defense deserves a lot of credit for those stops. There were also there was one particular that I can think of. They settled for a field goal when he he just airmailed a dude. Yeah, you know, first, in, first in the quarter, end, yep. yeah, yep. airmailed a guy in the end zone. Now you turn some of those. Alabama deserves credit for the stops, and they deserve credit for the comeback. You take a couple of those field goals and make those touchdowns. You're talking about something completely different in that game, and we're having a different kind of conversation about Joe Milton and about Tennessee. And now it's a really fascinating time, I think, for for the Big Orange because such a giant step forward last year. And now you go to Kentucky, you've got Georgia coming, and following that with a, you know, if it were to be a four loss, a three loss season probably just feels like, okay, we didn't have hooker. We didn't have Hyatt, you know, still really good. You start getting into that four loss ter- territory or more. And if it feels like you, you missed a full, uh, missed an opportunity to keep growing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you yeah. got to go to Missouri. The right. 11, Great point. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that's a game that we, we, we just kind of whatever, but, but there, there, they that's sit one game. You know, yeah. yeah they're, I mean, they're, 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 they're Mizzou sits, you know, seven and one and, and honestly probably should be undefeated. And you asked South Carolina uh, about going to the other Columbia, which is what they did this past weekend. And Missouri is really, really good. So yeah, suddenly Tennessee, you're right. They're wavering a little bit, but, but, but it's, it is the one thing that you thought you had going into the year was Joe Milton. You know, all right, we're good. You know, the way he played at the end of the year when he had to step mm-hmm. in for Hooker, um, everybody agreed that's the part we don't have to work on. The offensive line's playing great. Their run game is arguably the best in the Southeastern Conference. Their defense has played really well, including, you know, they just had to be on the field the entire game, you mm-hmm. know, on Saturday. Otherwise, they've played great all year. The one thing that's not working is the passing game. And it's just it's it's the one thing at Tennessee, certainly with Josh Hopper, you thought you could count on. So yeah, I'm with you. It's it's a little uh it's a bit of a tightrope going forward. But but don't you but the way this year has gone, and honestly, the way last year's regular season went, now you sit there and you look at that Georgia game, and Tennessee could go into that game with two more losses, and then they could win that game. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, it's it's just the way this year has gone. You know, the funny thing is, Ryan, I, I look at this season and it's been the year of the near miss. Yeah, I mean, we we spent some time on Virginia and North Carolina, but that that's not – it's devastating for North Carolina, but that's not the season-altering college football playoff picture uh, disruptive shaping game 
There hasn't been that yet. UCF Oklahoma could have been, wasn't. Houston, Texas could have eliminated them, didn't. Um, you know, and you start looking at how this might shake out, and with the notable exception of Clemson being nowhere near the picture, you're still looking at Michigan, Ohio State, potentially Alabama or LSU and Georgia, which, you know, I guess LSU would have a hard time getting in, even as SEC champion, I think, but but maybe not. You know, maybe if they have a win in Tuscaloosa and a win over Georgia, maybe not. Um, but you're starting to look at Georgia, Alabama or LSU, Michigan, Ohio State. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it looks very similar to what it's been. And and Oklahoma still, you know, they've, they've been Hanging in around. the playoff. Texas hasn't been yet. And then I think we are going to get, I think anyway, we're still going to get a team from the Pac-12 unless – they because I do believe that that's the deepest conference in terms of high quality teams. The number of high quality teams that are that are close enough that they can beat you. That maybe they cannibalize each other to the degree that they eliminate each other. But I still suspect we'll get one out of there. And oddly, the champion that almost now feels as if it needs to be undefeated is Florida State. Yep, you know, 100%. I mean. Yep. Yeah, even yep. though I really think they're good, I, I think they're you know I think they're terrific. Now, where they if they were to stumble and still win the ACC, let's say LSU gets to the SEC championship game, then that's going you know that's really going to help the Seminoles' cause. But let's say LSU doesn't, uh, you know, or let's say they get run, you know, by by Georgia, and then you're deciding. I think the Seminoles are fine if they're undefeated, but they're going to need to be undefeated. I think to to get there right the way it's starting to look yeah. anyway. It's Unless funny. we start having these upsets that actually get home instead of just getting close. Well, the Big Ten's just now starting. You know, yeah. we're, we're, you know, when we get to November, suddenly Michigan's going to play games. You know, and 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 you know now we got Ohio State, and and now you know now the Big Ten's going to get going, and the Pac-12, if they do what you're talking about, if they start to cannibalize you know, itself, that's that's what they've always done in September. You know, mm -hmm. you know, they, 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 to their credit, they schedule those big games. I think about Stanford, USC is always early in the season. They would always schedule those games in September. And by the time we got to week four, the Pac 12 is off the board. It's mm -hmm. been like that for years. Now they're hanging around. Now the SEC has the potential to do that, you know, in reverse as we get into the last part of the year. So I'm, I'm with you. And isn't it funny? All the people now who are screaming and yelling, man, this would be a great year for a 12 team playoff. I don't agree. I think this is the perfect year for the last round of four teams because I want it to be really hard to get in. I, I don't want. I don't want to know. I want. I want you and me to be really surprised when I'm sitting on my couch watching you reveal, you know, the final four playoff teams when we get to December. Because to me, I think it's going to be the perfect send off uh, for the four team playoff format, which I did not like in the beginning, but but 100 came around on. I remember sitting in the press box. At the ACC championship game with Pat Forty, and who was working with us at the time, and, and looking at Pat, I, this was the year of the Big Twelve. You know, Bob Bowles be going to two different games and declaring two different champions, and where we were sitting, Georgia Tech almost upset Clemson, uh, had a chance to in, in the championship game. We were looking at each other, going, "Maybe four isn't such a bad deal." And so I think this year is going to be the good send, uh, uh, the perfect send off for the four teams. I think it's going to be, we might actually have a. a a, a debate going into that thing. I hope so. Anyway, we ha we haven't had many. Uh, no, there no. have been minor minor debates here and there over the years. 2014, yep. the first year of the playoff, the three way debate among Baylor, TCU, and Ohio State. Reasonable takes on all fronts. Ohio State made that massive statement, you know, behind Cardell Jones, third quarterback, and saying, "Yeah, our third quarterback's fine." You know, they scored 59 or something yeah. on Wisconsin. Went on to win the national championship. 17. There was some debate between Alabama and Ohio State for the last spot. Um, I, I thought Ohio State had a disqualifying loss that year because they, you know, they they had a loss to Iowa one year, lost to Purdue one year, which wasn't just stubbing your toe and getting beaten by a field goal. They got trucked, yeah. you know, a couple of yeah. times. And, and when you're at the margins, I think those types of things have to count. But it was still a debate. It was certainly reasonable if you, you know, if you favored Ohio State in that situation. Yeah. Um, so, but not not much else. There there has hasn't been a lot of intrigue 
And there might be this year. And it's the one thing that I do think when the 12-team playoff comes around that we're going to lose a little bit is this weekend, for instance, college game day is going to Salt Lake City for Oregon, Utah. And that is a game that under the new format, there are certainly implications under the current one, but under the new format, that would be a team that's sort of toward the bottom of the 12-team field as we speak right now and one that's on the outside looking in. It's sort of a flip game. You know, so as opposed to having the all or nothing of trying to win and and maybe get to the Pac-12 championship game and maybe win that and get in, you have you have this safety net and there's some good things about it. And you're going to lose some intrigue yep. along along with it, too. Hey, yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, about on the subject of Utah. Utah beating USC when USC's back was against the wall. When Utah had, I don't want to say blown it, but kind of blown it by punting the ball to Zachariah Branch, he ran down there, he put him in position as he took the lead away from him, and they came back, and Bryson Barnes breaks a long run and sets him up with a chip shot field goal, and, you know, USC is sort of, right now, there, there's a lot of criticism surrounding the program because they keep losing the same way. You know, nothing ever changes. The proverbial definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. They don't get the key stops. They, you know, they get out toughed, which Utah, you know, Utah did to them again. And that I'm not doing the Lou Holtz thing. I'm not saying SC's not tough. I'm just saying <laughs> Utah, Utah's tougher. I think that's pretty much documented. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, so there, you know, Notre Dame on that evening was tougher. And so now USC has to try to find a way to step up. And from what I've seen from the Trojans, I don't think they're done losing. Not you know, not with Oregon and Washington still on the boards. And I assume that that was the end of that type of performance from Washington for this season, I would assume. Um, so they may not be done losing. And then Lincoln Riley says, you know, no media access to players. Okay. Do what you're going to do. I did. Did you notice this, Brian? There is a there's a National Labor Relations Board thing going on right now, and USC answered as part of USC's answer. This is like within the last few days, apparently. Part of USC's answer was this: We encourage all of our athletes to make themselves available to the media. <laughs> <laughs> we view this as part of the growth and the yeah. educational experience one has here at USC. And almost on cue, you lose a game and Lincoln Riley goes, uh, small town Texas, going to bully the Oklahoma student newspaper for looking out the window. I'm not going to let you talk to my players. I'm not a fan of that. And I like Lincoln personally. He's been, you know, he's been uh, good to deal with. For the most part, a couple of little minor issues over the years, but for the most part, you know, he's certainly a friendly guy and decent to deal with. Um, for the most part, you can read between the lines there. So yeah. not quite over some uh uh slide of hand things in an Oklahoma Baylor game a few years ago, but other than that, <laughs> um, you know, they're um, you know, he's been he I, I think he's a good person, but man, sure, you're you're in Los Angeles, dude. No, you're I've seen in him Los up. Angeles, and no, they're I've paying, seen, these, seen him up. paying these guys hundreds of thousands of dollars now you've got the most recognizable face in the sport you lost it happens it's disappointing i know you're angry about it and and because he's a competitor he's a fine offensive coach you got face the music dude i mean you know none of us like it i don't like it when i have to face the music when something doesn't go my way or i make a mistake nobody likes it but you have to and i i really really think this is a bad look for him. He needs, I, I think he ought to come out and maybe he's going to do it by the time his podcast drops. I think he should come out in the news conference uh, this week. And say, yeah, you know what? I was mad. I, that was, that was a misstep on my part. And we, we won't let that happen again. I, that was just me being, just me being pissed off. I, I wish he would do that. If he did that, yeah, me go, too. you know what? Good, good for you. That's fine. It happens. People, people have errors in judgment in the heat of the moment. It happens. Yeah, but he's having more of these. That that's the problem is, you know, we had to had to deal with we we threw the 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 the, the, the beat writer out a few weeks ago, and now now we're not going to make players available. Yeah, and and oh by the way, literally right across the courtyard from the Hall of Champions, you know, is the Annenberg School, which is one of the great <laughs> journalism. For our friend Willow Bay over there is the dean. I I'd love to ask her what she thinks about all this because because it, it's it's um 
it's just, it's a tough spot. And if and I was having this conversation on Friday night, so before all this happened, with an SID at a very prominent, you know, Division One school, and we were talking about taking the opportunity for wins and losses of using this. So, you know, if we're, if we're going to pitch NIL as, and we're going to pitch agents, and we're going to pitch all these things as helping guys get ready for the next level, well, a big, a huge part of the next level is handling this. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, I would say that Alabama probably a month ago would not have wanted to make Jalen Milrow available to Marty Smith for a thirty minute sit down. They did this week because they, you know, because they realize if we're really going to help him develop, not just as a football player, but as a as a multifaceted person, mm-hmm. then you have to do that. And I tell you this, I go back. I told this story on the show before when Butch Jones, when it was when it was at the end for him at Tennessee, and. And I remember, and I, I knew it when I was talking to him that he was reading everything that was written about him. Mm-hmm. And and they and 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 they lost to Georgia. That game was over in five minutes. The only time I've ever seen fans leave the stand. He essentially lost his job that day. But the conversation that I had with him that day, and I'm not speaking out of turn. I, he I made him mad when I told this story, you know, three years ago. But it doesn't anymore. It was I, he was reading everything that was written about him? Do you think that Nick Saban spends a lot of time reading what's written about him? Maybe. But he doesn't let it affect his job, and and I just when when guys start doing the types of things that Lincoln Riley's doing, they're not focusing on what they need to focus on, and um and I don't think they're helping the team focus on what they need to focus on. So I'm with you. Hopefully he'll he'll see the error of his ways. I like him. Um, I haven't talked to him in a while. I'm not entirely sure who this guy is, and I'm watching from three thousand miles away versus the guy I knew at Oklahoma or the guy mm-hmm. I knew at East Carolina. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, but I'm curious to see what he does going forward. Maybe maybe. Maybe it's a learning experience for him. We'll see. You know, and, you know the interesting thing too. There, the question was broached a few days ago. How's he going to fare when he doesn't have an absolute magician? Yeah. At quarterback. Yeah. Well, the good news for him is, is that he's so good at recruiting quarterbacks, and that's such a fertile ground there. He's probably always going to have some some degree of magician. Maybe you're not going to yeah. have. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're not going to have Caleb, but you know the run of from when he was an OC to the head coach at Oklahoma, Baker to Kyler, to Jalen Hurts, to Spencer Rattler, which was yep. fine for a while, then to Caleb, and now to USC with Caleb. That's that's a that's a pretty good pretty good run. But yeah. it's it's a it's a trying time for them. Came close last year. Heisman Trophy winner returning. Think maybe you're going to see some improvement. I would argue there is some improvement on defense, but they haven't come through in the clutch because you simply you you simply cannot let uh, Bryson Barnes, who's a good athlete. But, you know, he's he's not Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson or Jalen Hurts, you know, getting out and running and to, you know, escape and run you into easy field goal. You, it, there are it's like I used to tell my kids, Ryan, everybody's going to have a misstep. Everybody's going to have an accident from time to time. There are some accidents that can't happen. There are some mistakes that you just cannot make. And that's one of them in that situation from a football context that, you know, you, you know, just <laughs> don't let them out of the gate, man. Yeah, you yeah. know, especially if it's not, you know, it's different if you are, I keep bringing up Lamar because I want to go to the extreme example or, or Josh Allen, who, you know, always seems to find an opening running or even Trevor Lawrence. Um, you're he, he's a good athlete, but you're not dealing with that. So, you know, sometimes you say, okay, we are ready for Lamar Jackson to escape the pocket. And he does anyway. <laughs> you know, there's not, you know, we have Marvin Harrison Jr. covered and yeah. he catches it anyway. Yeah. You know, I mean, that yeah. happens. That's not what happened Saturday yeah. night against Utah. No. They they had a breakdown and off he goes and you know, and then they lose the game. It's so. an interesting thing to, on the Utah side, though. By the way, I'm wearing my Salt Lake Bees minor league baseball cap because you guys are going to Salt Lake City, but but I I love going there. I you know I, I've been very vocal on this podcast about how much I love Kyle Winningham. But but here's the flip side of that. I remember going out to Utah before the USC game in 2019. Spent a couple hours with with Wit, and what we talked about was that mental block because so many times USC had been the one thing in the way that Utah could never get around One, you know, ever since they joined the Pac-12. And, in fact, that week, when me out there doing the story, they went to the Coliseum and laid an egg and lost a game they shouldn't have and, and ended up costing them a pac But But now they've won, 
what four in a row, mm-hmm. and so, and and, yeah. and it's amazing what happens. And again, going back to Tennessee, going back to Penn State, once you learn that you can actually win the game, and you win a couple of them, you know the other guys are in trouble because the one thing that they had going for them that you didn't have going for you was, you know, it, it's it's Harry Gant from Stroker Ace, right? Oh hell, here we go again. And you could see it on Alabama's or on Tennessee's face at Alabama. Like, oh, no, here we go again. Utah expected to win that game, no mm-hmm. matter what the situation was. Three years ago, I don't think that was the case. But now, I mean, they own USC. They won four in a row. And and, and they ruined Caleb Williams' Heisman celebration last year. Yeah. And so so it's an interesting – it's an interesting mindset. It really is. And it's, uh, and USC is on, on the other side of that and Utah is on the side they weren't on for a long time. So, um, you guys are gonna have a great time this weekend. I'm jealous. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to getting out there and having Kyle on the show. Like you, I think a lot of him enjoy talking to him really, really tough guy. And I would say that you could probably, I don't know the name of the library at the university of Utah, but whatever the name of it is, you could fill an entire section with volumes of anecdotes that would put on uh, put on paper the toughness epitomized by Kyle Whittingham's Utah program. The latest example of that is I cannot think of many teams that would not have gotten the poor me's melted down. I can't believe we let this get away after that punt return, but not them, man. Not them, you know, and there are so many, even extends to the kickers. I mean, I'm, you know, with my friend, Pat McAfee, I don't want to pick on kickers anymore. (laughs) And I think, you know, if you're a college kicker, you're a good kicker, right? Yeah. But a lot of times because they're young and because of the circumstance and because we've seen it a lot, you see a kicker trot out there for what should be a makeable field goal for a FBS level kicker. And you think, I don't think he's going to make it. You know, or you're sitting there with your buddy and say, you put a bean on this, you know, yep. you make or miss. Yep. It even extends to the kickers. When they ran down there to the middle, I was like, oh, it, this is good, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no. there's no it's way, the way, there's the no way a Utah yeah. Ute is going to yep. miss this kick. That is not happening. And you know, know it's probably so. some guy, some guy from Australia, because they got a half a dozen of those guys right <laughs> yeah, kicking. And by, yeah. and by the way, and this will not surprise you at all, it is the J. Willard Marriott Library. And as a as a proud titanium elite lifetime, whatever I am now, there you go. So you know, that's, we uh, need, we Lumber. need our, we need our listeners to weigh in on this because I learned something. I think, I think I did anyway at the NFL draft last year, you know, how, how they give you uh, the promotions, the commercial cards or the sponsor cards and stuff yeah. like that, that you read, like in the case of the NFL draft, it was when Todd McShay, then or Mel Kuyper's best available comes up and it was brought to you by one of the hotel chains, the yeah. courtyard by, and they put in parentheses after courtyard by parentheses, M A R R Y hyphen I T T drilling it into my head to pronounce this courtyard by Marriott Marriott. I, I don't, but Ryan, I, I don't know because my entire life, I mean, you go to the Marriott, the courtyard by Marriott. Uh, you know, I thought it was Marriott. I yeah. don't know. Maybe uh, I, can I can get to the bottom of that on my trip to uh, Salt Lake City. It's like Jordan I can Hare, tell you guys. a waste of time. Hey, it's like Jordan Hare. I, I called it Jordan Hare Stadium no, that's my just entire flat life. Wrong. And, 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 and a couple of years ago, we did Marty McGee at, at J- Jordan Hare. Yes. And as soon as I stepped off the set, Bruce Pearl was standing there and he goes, I can't believe you're doing this. Like, what are we talking about? I said, he said, you just called it Jordan Hare like 17 times. So he goes, I almost inter-, he said, he said, I wanted to correct you during our interview, but yeah. So, and all, you know, by the way, if you ever stayed in a JW Marriott, now, you know, it's uh Jay Willard. There we okay. go. There, we, there you go. So we, 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 we're all about the education here, but yeah, yeah I should already, I should already know that because I'm looking at the app I've spent, almost 60 nights in Marriott's this year. I'm not saying you you should know. I don't know how you would know that. And I don't know that for, uh, for 1000% that the, the person who did that from our sales department was right about that either. But I, I complied because they obviously, they obviously went to a lot of trouble to to make me do it as for, as it, I'm really surprised that, that you were, you know, weren't, Maybe I mean I know I grew up in Alabama. It was Ralph Shug Jordan, Jim Gallero, our esteemed producer of College yeah. Game Day and loyal listener of the College Game Day podcast. 
he he would keep saying it and then he makes fun of Jordan. And I'm like, of saying it, Jordan. I'm like, it's the man's name, Jim. You know, it's it I mean, what it your, is. your name's pronounced Guy Arrow, and we accommodate yeah. that. You know, yeah. I mean, the man's name's Jordan. And, you know, so people who try to make fun, uh, you know, of our Southern heritage, that's a man's name. In fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I different guy, but same pronunciation. I believe my father-in-law went to who you, who you know, um, went to uh, went to high school at Jordan High School in Columbus, Georgia. There you in go. that in that region, that little pocket of the South, uh, the name the same name, which is spelled the same way as Michael Jordan, is pronounced Jordan. Well, so, when when I uh, the next time I go down to Auburn to cover a game at Jordan Hare, I will likely go. stay at a Marriott. Marriott. <laughs> Marriott, Marriott, whatever, yes, whatever, 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 it is. whatever it was. I don't you know. Said. We'll, yeah, find, I'll, we'll, I'll get, know we'll get to the bottom of it. We'll get to the bottom of it. <laughs> See, not just football. You get some nonsense on this podcast too. Before we get out of here, um, Taylor, Taylor had had a moment this weekend. Actually, Taylor and Sarah, great producers, did one. Nebraska's turned the corner. Sarah's convinced that Nebraska's going to the Big Ten championship game and bringing a football title uh, back to the volleyball school. And and Taylor had a moment after after cruelly trolling some uh, Virginia family members. Uh, Taylor, tell me what what happened there. You sent me photographs in a text chain of of some, the, your Virginia family members celebrating the victory over the Tar Heels. Yeah. So my uh, my my brother in law Scott Betridge, his wife uh, Pam, their son Will Betridge is the starting kicker for Virginia. And uh, if you recall a couple of weeks ago, listening to the podcast, uh, Maryland played Virginia. I went down to College Park for the game. There was controversy in my household whether I should wear um, my Maryland gear or wear something neutral, whether that would be offensive. Ultimately, I got the go ahead from Stanford Steve and my wife, both important people in my life there. Um, but so my my brother-in-law, Scott, uh, and his wife, Pam, they go to every game, no matter where it is. So they were in Chapel Hill and the cameras caught them at the end of the game agonizing over the whole thing there was a great shot of them both like slumped over my brother-in-law scott head in hands and then after the the pick at the end of the game scott like falling backwards into his friends behind them uh, my sister-in-law pam going crazy it was uh, really a lot of fun happy for that's, those guys that's awesome that's that's really cool that's what it's all about um, i i do need to talk to you offline about listing the important people in your life and putting Stanford Steve ahead of your wife. I think we even need to talk about that. Can I add bit. one? I wasn't going to say thing. anything, but I was thinking, it. yeah. 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 Uh, so my, my lovely wife who, uh, who is, who is number one, she's my number okay. one overall seat, even if Stanford Steve might be too. Um, but she worked at Marriott. And when she oh. did her employee training day one, they tell you it is Marriott, not Marriott. It's Marriott okay. rhymes with chair. Really? There yes. Go. Really? There you All go. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I am a loyal to a fault. I'll drive past six other hotels to stay at a Marriott. And now I'm going to make sure I call it that though, though I'm pretty sure the employees in the, in the deep South where I primarily travel in the summer, in the fall, I'm not sure if they know about that rule, but I'll, 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 <laughs> but I'll, I'll start, a, I'll start letting them know. They, they skipped employee training that day. Sarah, we got the, we're going to whip the Huskers home and celebrate with, uh, with chili and cinnamon rolls. Oh you yeah, you know it, Reese. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Glad think glad things are going well. Thank you for listening to the College Game Day podcast. Pete Thamel will be back later this week. He is on assignment. I'll let you guess what that is. And uh thanks for listening. I would ask you to subscribe to the College Game Day podcast so you never miss an episode. We'll talk on Wednesday.